Welcome. Today we're looking at some really thought-provoking work, a paper called Nested Learning, The Illusion of Deep Learning Architectures. It's from Google Research, Ali Beruz, Maisam Razavian, Peeling Zon, and Vaha Marokni. Yeah, this one's quite something. It tries to tie together model architecture, memory, and even how we optimize models, all under one umbrella. Right, and the core idea is the thing called nested learning, NL for short. It suggests we should think of any ML model as uh, a set of nested optimization problems, like layers within layers, but for optimization, each level managing its own sort of internal context flow. Exactly. And the really big claim here is that NL shows current deep learning methods while they work by basically compressing this context flow. But here's the kicker. They argue that standard optimizers, you know, Atom, SGD with momentum, they're not just optimizers. They are actually associative memory modules. Associative memory. So the optimizer itself is remembering things. Precisely. Remembering and compressing the gradients, using gradient descent itself to do the compressing. It's kind of mind bending. OK, so if that's the framework, it gives us a way to build better learners, right. right? By adding more levels. That's the idea. The paper introduces things like deep optimizers, optimizers with like Dupper memory and self-modifying titans, which sounds cool, a sequence model that learns how to change its own update rule. And that all leads to their main architecture, HPE, mm. which uses a continuum memory system or CMS. Sounds like a way to blend short-term and long-term memory better. Yeah, exactly. And they show it has real promise for things like continual learning and handling really long contexts. Okay, that's a packed summary. Let's dig in a bit. Why do we even need this nested learning idea? What's wrong with our current giants like the big LLMs? Well, their success comes from just stacking more and more layers, right? Getting bigger and deeper. But that brute force scaling doesn't really crack some fundamental challenges. Like adapting quickly or learning continuously without forgetting. Exactly. Fast adaptation, true continual learning, generalizing well when the data shifts. Stacking layers doesn't inherently solve those. It adds capacity, but the learning mechanism itself might be limited. So just making them bigger isn't the whole answer. Right. And the authors use this really vivid analogy. They compare a typical pre-trained LLM to someone with anterograde amnesia. Whoa, amnesia. That's strong. You mean like... They yeah. can't form new long-term memories after they've been trained? Pretty much, yeah. The knowledge from pre-training, that's baked into the MLP layers. That's the long-term store. But any new information, it only exists in the immediate context window. It's short-term. And crucially, that short-term context info doesn't really update the long-term weights. In a standard transformer, not effectively, no. It can't consolidate that new information into the permanent structure. So the model sees something new, processes it based on its old knowledge, but doesn't fundamentally learn from it in a lasting way. Which is obviously very different from how, say, your human brain learns. Totally different. Our brains have neuroplasticity, right? Mm -hmm. We have this process called online consolidation or synaptic consolidation. New memories start fragile, but immediately begin stabilizing and integrating. They start transferring from short term to long term right away. Exactly. LLMs, once pre-training stops, they largely lack that ongoing consolidation. They're kind of stuck, amnesiac, like the paper says. Okay, so NL is proposed as a way out of this static state. Before we get to the solutions, though, they define some key terms carefully, borrowing from neuropsychology. Memory versus learning. Yeah, this distinction is important for their framework. Memory, they define very simply. It's just any neural update caused by an input. A change happens. Okay, like a synapse changing strength slightly. Right. But learning is defined as the process of acquiring effective and useful memory. It's not just any change, it's change that helps achieve a goal. So touching a hot stove, the immediate reaction is a memory trace. Learning is figuring out not to touch stoves in the future because it's useful. Perfect analogy. And the core mechanism they propose for achieving this useful learning across all parts of a system is the associative memory. Right, you mentioned that. Yeah. Defined as an operator M, mapping keys K to values V, and it's optimized based on some objective function L tilt. Yep. And the key thing is, these keys and values can be anything, not just data points or tokens. They could be gradients, parts of sequences, historical states. That flexibility seems crucial. It lets them build this hierarchy using update frequency. Exactly. Update frequency is just how often a component gets updated per unit of time, say, per data point processed. Can you give a quick example? Sure. If I'm training, what has high versus low frequency? Sure. 
Think about your main network weights, W. They might only get updated once per batch, maybe a large batch. That's relatively slow, low frequency. Okay. But think about the momentum term in Atom or SGD with momentum, that little M vector. It gets updated every single step with every gradient calculation. That's high frequency. Ah, I see. So you can sort components into levels based on how fast they change. Higher level means uh, slower updates. Exactly. Higher level, lower frequency. And this creates the nesting. You have fast inner loops operating inside slower outer loops. And the key rule enforcing this nesting is what they call exclusive gradient flow. Right. This is fundamental. Components at different frequency levels have their own optimization objectives. When you optimize the slow outer level component, like the main weights W, the gradients don't flow back through the fast inner level component, like the momentum M. So you optimize the momentum based on its goal, maybe compressing gradients, and you optimize the weights based on the main loss, but those optimization paths are kept separate. Precisely. It's not one giant computation graph like we usually think of backprop. It's nested systems, each optimizing for its own thing at its own speed. This idea that, say, attention layers and the optimizer itself have separate gradient flows is, well, it's a different way of looking at things. Yeah, it reframes things from sequential layers to these hierarchical optimization systems working at different time scales. Okay, so now we can use this NL lens to sort of dissect existing methods. Let's start super simple. Training an MLP with basic gradient descent, GD. Our baseline. Yeah. In NL terms, this is just a one-level associative memory. Yep. The system, the MLP, is learning to map an input data point, XT plus one, to what they call the local surprise signal, or LSS, which is basically just the gradient of the loss with respect to the output. So the gradient tells you how surprised the model is by the new data point given the current weights and the objective. Exactly. It quantifies the mismatch. The MLP, the associative memory, is learning to compress the input X into the surprise needed to adjust the weights and reduce future surprise. Okay, simple enough. But things get interesting fast. Add momentum to GD. Suddenly, it's not one level anymore. Right. Just adding momentum turns it into a two-level optimization process, which is wild because we usually just think of momentum as, you know, helping smooth the path or speed things up. Like a ball rolling downhill with inertia. Yeah. But NL says, no, look closer. The outer level is still updating the main weights, WT, the slow part. But the inner level, that's the momentum term, MT plus one. It's itself a high-frequency associative memory. Doing what? Its job is to compress the history of past gradients. It has its own little optimization objective implicitly defined by the momentum update rule, which is basically a simple gradient descent step trying to summarize past surprises. Wow. Okay, so momentum is a tiny, fast updating memory system nested inside the main weight updates. That's the NIL perspective, and they show the same two-level structure pops up elsewhere, like in linear attention mechanisms. Ah, uh, interesting. How does that work? Well, in linear attention, you have that matrix MT that accumulates key value products. The update rule, MT plus 1, MT plus VT plus 1, K plus 1, they show this is equivalent to optimizing that matrix MT with a simple objective using GD. That's the fast inner loop associative memory. Okay, remembering the key value associations. Right. And then the outer loop optimizes the projection layers, WK, WV, WQ, the slower components. And again, the crucial part is the exclusive gradient flow. When you update the W projection matrices, you don't backpropagate through the accumulated memory map. Exactly. The optimization problems for the slow projections and the fast memory matrix are distinct. This whole idea that optimizers are memory modules, that really shifts things. It leads directly to their concept of deep optimizers, doesn't it? It does. If standard momentum is a simple, linear, somewhat limited, valueless, they say, associative memory, and I'll suggest we can make it much more powerful. How? What makes an optimizer's memory deeper or more expressive? Well, first, you can make the mapping richer. They talk about preconditioning. If the momentum memory doesn't just store gradients, but maps gradients to, say, preconditioning values, pi, it gains more utility. Like incorporating curvature information, maybe. Hessian stuff. Exactly. Functions of gradients often provide a more useful signal for the memory to compress than just the raw gradients themselves. That explains why things like Atom, which use second moments, work well. Makes sense. And they also tweet the objective for that inner momentum loop. Yeah. Instead of just adding gradients like simple momentum, they propose using an L2 regression loss for the inner objective. They call it the delta rule update. The idea is to make the momentum term explicitly try to minimize the error in its representation of past gradients, managing its limited capacity better. Okay, so smarter mapping, better inner objective. Yeah. 
but to make it truly deep. Then you apply the NL idea recursively. Replace the simple linear matrix or vector used for momentum with a full-blown multi-layer perceptron, MLP. That's Deep Momentum Gradient Descent, DMGD. So you're giving the optimizer its own little neural network to remember and process the history of gradients. Precisely. An MLP can capture much more complex non-linear dynamics in the gradient history than a simple linear update. You're literally adding depth to the optimizer's memory. And they even show connections to existing optimizers. Yeah, they mention that if you add a non-linearity to the output of this momentum MLP, and you use a specific method called Newton-Schultz for that non-linearity, you actually recover the muon optimizer. It shows how NL can sort of unify these different ideas. Okay, so we have these more powerful, deep optimizers. Now, how does this connect back to fixing the amnesia problem in LLMs? That brings us to the continuum memory system. CMS. Right. The CMS is designed specifically to mimic that biological online consolidation using multiple timescales. It generalizes the old binary split of short-term versus long-term memory. How's it structured? It's basically a chain of MLP blocks, let's say MLP. Each block in the chain is associated with a different update frequency, defined by a chunk size CO. So the first block might update really frequently, processing small chunks of data. The next block updates less often over larger chunks and so on down the chain. Exactly. The parameters Thea in the ELF block are specifically responsible for compressing context relevant to their time scale, their frequency domain. And the standard transformer feed forward block. That's just a CMS with only one block, K1, updating at a single frequency. That's the insight. CMS allows you to build blocks that operate and update at multiple nested timescales. It moves beyond the static single frequency update of st standard transformers and allows for that dynamic multi-level consolidation. Very cool. Which leads us finally to the HOPE architecture. Yeah. What is HOPE putting together? HOPE essentially combines this multi-timescale continuum memory system with a more sophisticated gradient descent method, one using that L2 regression objective, the delta rule, and designed to handle data dependencies explicitly. And crucially, it's self-referential. Yeah, it's designed so that the key value and query projections can dynamically change based on the context flowing through these different memory timescales. It's like the model learns to manage its own memory updates across different frequencies. Okay, so theory sounds compelling. Does it actually work? What did the experiments show? The results look pretty strong. They tested HP models at 760 million and 1.3 billion parameters. On language modeling tasks, perplexity on Wikitext, Ellen Benchmark, it performed very well. And reasoning tasks. Yeah, consistently good scores on common sense reasoning benchmarks like PIQA, Helleswag, ARC, SUSUA, BoolQ. Generally, it outperformed several strong baselines. Like transformer plus plus red, retnet, delta net. Right, and also the earlier Titans model from some of the same authors. The takeaway seems to be that this architectural nesting, the deep memory in the optimizer, combined with the multi time scale CMS and dynamic projections, really does lead to better performance. It allows for more efficient compression and use of context. So for people listening, the big picture here is that nested learning might offer a new way to scale and improve models beyond just making them wider or deeper. That seems to be the main thrust. It's adding a new dimension, the depth or number of levels in the learning algorithm itself. This could lead to models with better in-context learning, better adaptation, moving past that static nature we discussed. It's a really unifying perspective seeing optimizers, memory systems, attention mechanisms, all as instances of these nested associated memories, each compressing context at its own rate. Yeah, it ties a lot of threads together. Okay, let's wrap up with a final thought for you to consider. If, as this paper suggests, the momentum term in our standard optimizers is just the simplest level two example of a fast associative memory, what comes next? What kind of deeper, faster, more complex hierarchies of these memory systems do we need to build to truly capture the multi-timescale updates and the incredibly efficient consolidation we see in biological brains? That feels like the grand challenge NEL is putting forward. Yeah. How do we build truly nested intelligence? Something to think about.